All right, so we have D4 and E6, the Horwitz defense. Not to be confused with Horowitz. Knight to f3, c5, g3, knight f6, bishop to g2, pawn takes pawn and knight takes pawn, pawn to a6, pawn to c4, queen c7, Knight to d2. And that turns into, by the way, this move with c4 transposes it into a anti Benoni defense with the Spielmann variation. So knight to c6, knight takes knight, and b takes knight. Castle, bishop b7, and this move, bishop b7, is the first move unique to this game. So that's already move nine, a little bit earlier than a lot of the games we've seen, finding a novelty. Yep. Whenever you see the B pawn vacating, you can pretty much be sure, and same with the G pawn, as you saw here. You can be pretty much sure a finchetto is going to be played, especially if your opponent has already played one, you know, and is trying to control that long diagonal. So b3 tells me he's likely to play bishop b2. Although this does also help support this pawn, that's not really relevant right now. The, the real intention is more than likely going to be to move the bishop. Pawn to e4, bishop to e7, and there it is, bishop b2. Pawn to d6 here. Queen e2. And now he's castled. So, again, I want to just point out to those who are discussing it. Notice the minor pieces all out of their beds. And notice they're all looking at the center. With the exception of this bishop. King's castled. Queen, this queen's looking at the center. <laughs> this rook is ready to swing into action, probably to the b-file. Or it might stay there and see this rook come over to the b-file and leave the a-rook there to help this pawn up the board. Rooks are good elevators for pawns. You can just think of them as pushing those pawns up. That's why so often after castling you see the F pawn lifted and helped up the board. Oh, and speaking of which, pawn to F4 is played. Knight to D7 and now pawn to g4. He decided to play rook to e8.
getting in line with the enemy queen. Pawn to g5. Pawn to e5 now, looking for a pawn break. The pawn can't just pass freely because the g-man will then be hanging. So that's a good break. It's going to allow pawn takes pawn and an open file for this rook. Now on the other hand, it also opens the diagonal for this bishop. So white might, might, might not be too unhappy with this position. He just wants to get the queen off of this file so that black cannot attack it. And sure enough, he plays queen to h5. getting right in toward the enemy king. So queen back to d8 is played. And up comes the rook. Notice the pawn on h7 cannot move safely to h6. This bishop now is going to send an attack against h3. Here comes the other rook. So he's giving himself options. Does he use his rooks as elevators? Is he going to use his rook to double up? Is he just getting more people in the vicinity of the enemy king? Well, this move is clearly for the purpose of stopping any idea of rook to h3. Um, white might like to put his bishop on h3 and contest that diagonal. That would be a possible move. Why not f5 now? If you play f5 now, um, although it does cut off the light squared bishop, the bishop, the dark squared bishop could pick off the g man and then this pawn push would be possible after the rook moves over. Well, they brought the other rook over because it give first of all, you want to get as many pieces into the attack as you possibly can. You don't want to launch your attacks prematurely. You have to have the artillery there. And moves like this can be answered with moves like this. He also gives himself more options. He can still begin to think about pushing this pawn. It's not out of the question. He might be thinking about getting the rook on g3 as well. That's true, he could have moved it to h3 before. Let's go back. Let's say he plays rook to h3 here. It's a good move. It's basically forcing h6. Right? And, but what happens here? What's the continuation? I mean, white's winning here either way. He's got a, a big advantage either way. But suppose he takes this. Well, he's, don't assume he's going to take back. He could play knight f6 with an attack on the queen. He can play pawn to g6 with an attack on the queen. And then when the, even, even though you can give check, the king can use your own pawn. The king can use your own pawn as a sort of um, barrier. Is a very common technique that you want to learn about when you have a pawn breathing down your neck you can actually use it as a hiding place for your king because one of the rules of chess you can't capture your own piece boy you'd love to have a rule where you could capture your own pawn here because this is checkmate So it's important not to um, 
launch your attacks prematurely. Get as many pieces over there as you can. This is a good move here, bishop h3, pawn to f5, e takes f5, rook takes f5. Now that's interesting. Bishop takes rook. Now why not take with the bishop here, I wonder? Why not take with the bishop? Let's see if we can figure this out. <clears throat> If bishop takes bishop, and bishop takes bishop, and rook takes bishop, then rook to h3, then h6, yeah, it frees h3, exactly. And here you can infiltrate the black territory and have a huge attack going here. This pawn is pinned. It's going to be hard to get rid of this queen. He can't take. Taking is fatal. Well, right now his rook is in danger anyway, so he's got to do something like defend. And then, because this pawn is pinned, the rook can just take here, and this can still do the duty of warding off any attackers on f6. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's going to be unfortunate. All right, so for that reason, he gives up the exchange. But now you got this monster of an attack, and aren't you glad you took the time to bring that rook over now? <laughs> because white now owns the F file. Now this can be secured with G6, hits the queen and defends the, the bishop. Queen comes to H4. Bishop takes and attacks the queen again. Queen comes to g3. Okay, so we have a few things going on here. Now, notice this knight can't be taken here because that would pin the pawn. And it would create that huge attack again. But now the, the queen is also attacking here now. This might be time to give back some material. He did. Rook takes bishop, pawn takes, and then wow. Super attack, fork, super attack. He got so many things going on in, at one time. It's, it's almost mind-boggling. What a great move that was. That was a great time to give back the exchange. And first of all, you're getting a bishop and a pawn, and you're getting an, another attack going. You're getting tempo. Pawn to h6. Now knight to e4 hits it again. Rook to f8. Rook takes rook. In case you're wondering whether check was a move here, the rook can just drop back. And then you've got the queen in danger. King takes f8. Queen to f3 check, keeping on the initiative. King g8. Bishop takes on e5. Getting a solid look over at the king's position. Knight attacks. <laughs> Or 
horse is a, a trade here. Oh, well, this is interesting. Decided to attack here. Because if bishop takes, knight takes is check, and when the king gets out of check, then the bishop can take the bishop. Wow, that is clever. Pin the bishop, exactly twisted seed. Queen g4, pin it again! Queen a5, attack the pinned piece. h4, bada bing, bada boom. Queen e1, no. I thought queen e1 was coming. Instead, he goes after the pawn chain. Bishop takes knight, pawn takes bishop, pawn takes bishop. Now we're up ahead. Material. Pawn takes with, uh, queen takes pawn with check. King of seven. Queen gives another check. King e7. And here comes the seaman. A5, C6, and Black counted the moves and resigned. Wow, what a battle that was.